Good morning, afternoon or evening, whatever time you're watching this. My name is Esther and I'm part of the church family here at Ebenezer. And today we're starting a new three-part series. And we're going to be looking initially today at significance and identity. Then next week we'll be thinking about our emotions. And the final part of the series will be thinking about our thoughts. Today we're going to be reading from the Old Testament in the first book of the Bible called Genesis and we're going to be looking at chapter 32 and reading from verses uh, 22 to 30. So we'll come to that in a little bit. But firstly, what do you say when someone asks who you are? Do you say your name? What you do? Whether you're married or not? Whether you're a follower of Jesus? Or maybe you say something else? Generally, the first thing that we ask someone is their name, followed by what they do. We answer that question using external factors, as though that is where our security, our self-worth and our significance lies. Perhaps some of us here have experienced a significant change over this past year, and we're struggling with who we are, where our security is coming from. And whether we're good enough right now. Maybe we feel overwhelmed by our lives. We're confused, we're tired and we just don't know what to do. Perhaps for some of us we are struggling to be real. We've put on a front saying that everything is okay. But deep down we are struggling. We're just not doing okay. Even though it may not seem it, God is with us right now and always is. We are significant to him. He cares about us. He calls us his children. If we let him, he will show us that he can be trusted and that he has us firmly in his hands. So today we're going to be thinking about and hearing about a man named Jacob. So we're just going to look briefly at his life up till now because it'll just help us understand a little bit more about where he's at. So, Jacob is a twin, and his elder brother is called Esau. Now, on the way out of the womb, Esau came out, and Jacob grabbed his heel as he followed him out of the womb. I don't think he liked to be born second. Later on, uh, he cheated Esau out of his birthright and his blessing. And the eldest brother always gets a birthright and a blessing. But Jacob cheated him out of this. Jacob ran away. But then he got cheated by his uncle and ended up with two wives. Some may not uh, be too bothered about that. Then we see that Jacob cheated his uncle back. And again, he ran away. Jacob is now at a point where he's going to face his brother Esau, who he ran away from years earlier due to the threats Esau made against him. So we meet Jacob at a time where he is feeling insignificant, restless, insecure, inferior, scared and unsure what he will face in the morning. Let's be honest, things are a bit of a mess. So let's read now from Genesis 32. And starting at verse 22, now the words will appear on the screen. So it says, Jacob wrestles with God. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he'd sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, 
It is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. Many Christians believe that this man that Jacob wrestled with was a God appointment. God was behind it and very much in it. Now, as I often say with my sermons, when I read a passage, there is always so much stuff that I want to share, but I can't share everything. But today I've focused on three different things that I feel are key in this passage um, for me. And the first one is that wrestling with God is hard, but so worth it. So we read that Jacob wrestled with God from night until daybreak. This was hours, not a quick five minutes. It was hard. It was brutal. It was raw. It was honest. His hip was wrenched from his socket, which demonstrates the intensity of the wrestling. Wrestling for so many hours must have been exhausting. By the end, Jacob was holding on. He wouldn't let go. I imagine all of his energy would have been zapped. Now, Jacob may not have initially known who this man was. He may have been wrestling for his life. He couldn't see the man's features. It was dark, but he kept on going. He clung on until he got something out of this wrestle. Now, I wanted to um, know a bit more about what other people thought wrestling with God looked like. So I asked some of my friends, many of whom don't have a faith. And these were some of the responses. Someone said that they imagined a David and Goliath image, that God is bigger. Someone else said they envisaged a small man reaching up to God and God towering over him as he tries to wrestle him. I was sent photos of people being pushed up against the ropes in a ring and the opponent getting ready to close hook them. However, I don't believe that is what it looks like to wrestle with God. Firstly, wrestling with God is personal. There is no step-by-step -step guide on how to do it. It's real. It can be painful, not necessarily physically, but emotionally, mentally and spiritually. Jacob wrestled for hours and his hip got wrenched out during that time. When we wrestle with God, we show our true, authentic self. We leave our masks, our comparisons and our false selves behind and we begin to touch reality. And in the passage, we read that Jacob wrestled with a man. They were equals in part. Now, we don't know how big this man was, but we can assume that he was a similar size to Jacob. I don't believe that God towers over us. He comes to us as we are, on our level, in a relational way, so that we can do business with him face to face. Now, a lady called Anne Lamott says this. My belief is that when you are telling the truth, you are close to God. If you say to God, I am exhausted and depressed beyond words, and I don't like you at all right now, and I recoil from most people who believe in you, that might be the most honest thing you've ever said. If you told me that you'd said to God, it's all hopeless and I don't have a clue if you exist, but I could use a hand. It would almost bring tears to my eyes. Tears of pride in you for the courage it takes to get real. Really real. She mentions that when you're telling the truth, you are close to God. The truth isn't always pretty. It can be messy, it can be raw and hard to say. But I believe that God really appreciates it when we say it. Now I like to share a personal um, story when I do my sermons and this has been something that quite honestly I wrestled with whilst doing this sermon, knowing what to say. For me, when I wrestle with God, it can last a long time, but not necessarily in one chunk. I certainly have never wrestled from uh, night till daybreak because I'm generally asleep. Um, but I can wrestle with God on something for days, weeks, months, years even. In the last talk I did back in August, um, I shared that I'd been struggling with disordered thinking around food and appearance for over 10 years. 
this is one of those years of wrestling kind of things. When I wrestle with God, generally I tell him that I don't have the energy to deal with it anymore. I don't understand why I've not been healed from it. I ask, why hasn't he taken this cup of suffering from me? A question that with all the help I've had, why do my unhelpful thoughts still linger? And I question, and this for me is the really tough one, is whether I really believe I'm a child of God, because surely if I did, then I wouldn't struggle with those thoughts. I get angry, I get frustrated, I feel sad, I feel hurt, alone, guilty, selfish, but relief that I'm being honest. I speak to God in a way that comes from my core. It's raw. But I don't necessarily get answers to my questions. I'm not necessarily healed at the end of my time of wrestling. But I do feel that a weight has come off my shoulders and out of my heart. I feel heard. I feel loved. And actually, at the end of it, I do trust God more, that he's got me and he's with me. If I stop to listen, <coughs> key point, I generally hear God's voice, which I've come to recognise over the years. He says that he feels the pain too, that I'm not alone, that he is with me always. For me, wrestling with God brings me closer to him because my honesty doesn't scare him away. He doesn't reject me because I say horrible things and he still loves me the same as he did before the wrestling began. It's the same for you too. I have days where God asks me if I want to step in the ring and I say to him, quite honestly God, I'm too tired today. He doesn't say, you worse, you're weak. He says, that's okay. I'm here when you're ready. I don't think God forces us to wrestle with him until we're ready. But I do think, like with Jacob, that he will stop us if we keep trying to run away. As Christians, we are called to be followers of Jesus, to live like him. And even Jesus was raw and honest with God. Jesus, the son of God who knew what was going to happen to him, had it out with God. If Jesus did it, then we can too. But to wrestle with God, I think we need to choose to step into that place where the truth will come out, where it might be painful, where it will be raw. When we wrestle with God, I don't believe for a second that he thinks, oh, here we go again. Instead, I imagine him saying, get in the ring and give me all that you've got. That's it. Get it out. Let me know what you really think. But maybe that's just me, though. And my excuse to keep spouting at him about how I feel. The other thing about wrestling, and this I think is quite tough, is that wrestling is two way. If we are being real with God, then we need to let him be real with us. We can tell him exactly how we feel and think, but we have to be prepared to listen to what he has to say too. Sometimes we then wrestle with what God has just told us and the process continues. Wrestling with God is hard, but it is so worth it. Which leads me nicely onto my next point. When we wrestle with God, things change. Up to this point, Jacob had been relying on himself, his own way of doing things. It had done him well to a point, no, it's not alright. Yet he had to run away twice. And now he feared for his life due to cheating his brother out of his birthright and his blessing. We read that Jacob had sent his wives and children across the river. He was alone. This suggests that there were things he needed to deal with in his life. And soon, if he was to survive being Esau, he was desperate. He recognised his own resources were not enough. When we wrestle with God, eventually something will give. Something in us changes. It may be a small change, but there'll be a change. It might be that we understand God more. 
And we get a further understanding of God's will for us. We hope for a positive outcome. If we can trust the one that we wrestle with, it brings about, about great changes in our characters and in our personalities. We discover that God is enough, that we can trust him, and that to him and in him we are significant. So what happened to Jacob? Well, we read that he was given a new name. That's a pretty big deal. He went from heel grabber and deceiver to Israel. You have struggled with God and man and overcome. Wow. Through wrestling with God, the crooked Jacob was made straight. It was also, a little nugget of knowledge, that by this name Israel, that the great nation of the Jews, the Israelites, will come to be named. That is some change. Thing is, it didn't make Jacob sorted or perfect. He certainly made some pretty questionable choices in his life. But in those days, names held significant meaning. They weren't just designations, but descriptions. A change in name would often coincide with a significant personal or spiritual change. The passage says that the man asked Jacob what his name was. Perhaps he wanted Jacob to be real, to say what name he carried and what it meant. This was an honest moment for Jacob after so much deception. This was Jacob's opportunity to turn from self-dependence to God-dependence. God then revealed the name he was giving him, how he saw him, his new identity, his future as God saw it. But Jacob wasn't the only one who was given a new name in the Bible. So also in the Old Testament and also in Genesis, you can read how a man named Abraham was given a new name by God of Abraham. He went from exalted father to a father of many nations. That is what God had promised him. And Abraham became the father of many nations. We read that his wife, Sarai, became Sarah. She went from princess to my princess, mother of nations. She grows into a woman who begins to trust God's promises rather than laugh at them. And the example of this is um, when God promised her and Abraham a child. She laughed because they were beyond childbearing age. But surprise, surprise, spoiler, they had a child. But it wasn't just in the Old Testament that new names were given. In the New Testament, Simon, who was one of the disciples of Jesus, was given a new name, Cephas, which means Peter. Simon means he has heard, and Peter means rock. Despite Peter's many failures, he grew to understand the power of being known and completely accepted by God. He started out as a fisherman, but after a change of name, he began to live up to his name, preaching boldly and helping to build Christ's church on earth. So I'm just going to give us a chance to pause and reflect, because I'm aware I've said a lot. And I want us to think about now, what name do we speak over ourselves? It could be fear, resentment, guilt, pride, self-pity, not enough insignificant. And once you've thought about that, I'd like you to ask God what name he gives you. And this is not going to be something negative. God does not speak that negative stuff over us. So let's just take um, a minute or so just to think about that. Now, I know I haven't given you much time, 
And I would really encourage all of us to spend more time of this today or in this next week and rest with God on it if you've got to. Like, hash it out. Don't live with those negative names over yourself. Let God tell you what name he's given you. When we wrestle with God, things change. So, last point. And this is something that I believe, anyway. Wrestling with God isn't about winning. Now, wrestling is a sport. It's where two people grapple using their hands and attempt to pin the other person to the mat. There are no weapons involved. That kind of wrestling is about winning. Now, I've never wrestled. Don't know if I'd be any good, but we'll see. However, and some people may disagree, and that's okay. I don't believe that wrestling with God is about winning. In the passage, we see that it was the man who asked to be let go. And Jacob did, but only after he received his blessing. So who won? Jacob. (laughs) After all, he was the one who let the man go and he received a blessing. I don't think it's that simple. As we've just considered, when we wrestle with God, things change. Jacob left that wrestling match with a new name, a new identity, a new way of living. Was that God's plan? Possibly. Most probably. So did God, in fact, then win? Does it matter? That period of wrestling left Jacob a changed man forever. Not only did he walk with a limp due to his hip being wrenched out, but he was more confident in who he was and his focus changed. Personally, I see that as a win-win situation. Jacob's limp gave him a permanent reminder of that encounter with God. That moment that changed his life forever. When I wrestle with God... I obviously want my own way, yet most often something inside me gives. I change. I see more of God's heart and his will. I win because I understand more of who God is. I trust him more. God wins because I change, even if it's just a tiny bit. Now, as someone who is pretty competitive, I don't mind being a joint winner with God, but I know that sounds really cheesy. So what did happen to Jacob? Did Esau, in fact, kill him? No. (laughs) The next day, Jacob made his way to meet Esau with confidence and a limp in his step. Esau met him with a hug and with forgiveness. In return... Jacob sought to return the blessing that he had cheated Esau out of. The promises he'd received from God slowly began to be fulfilled. Even though it looks as though Jacob's life was sorted, it really wasn't. Wrestling with God doesn't mean that all the difficult stuff gets sorted, fixed or solved. But it does bring us closer to our Father in heaven. So what about Jesus then? Jesus came to show people that they were significant, that they are enough and that they are loved completely. He lived a life that included being persecuted. He was then killed on a cross and rose again three days later, overcoming all the wrong that we do so that we can be relational with God and do business with him face to face. The truth is, and this is maybe quite hard for some people to hear, that no matter how hard we work, we can't become better versions of ourselves without Jesus. Jacob tried, and look where that got him. So where do we go from here? Well, maybe you have never heard about Jesus before, and you're thinking you might want to know a little bit more about him and about this Christian way of life that I've talked a bit about. At Ebby, we're going to be running um, an alpha taster and hopefully an alpha course. So keep an eye out for that on the website and do get stuck into that. I would encourage you to keep spending time with God. 
and ask him what name he calls you. And as I said, wrestle it out if you have to. For those of us that know Jesus and follow him, we've got to live an authentic life. We've got to live for and like Jesus. That means being real and honest. But it may be that you know of someone who feels or is in a never-ending wrestling match with life or God. Pray for them. Ask them how you can be praying for them. Even if they don't have a faith for themselves, keep praying for them. But finally, you may feel like you are someone that's in that never-ending wrestling match. I would encourage you to ask for prayer. Like, we're in this together. You're not alone going through this stuff. So I'm just going to pray to close. Father, I thank you that you are always with us. That you love us, Lord, no matter where we are in life right now. I thank you that you know us personally. That you know all about us. You know our failures. You know the things that we do wrong. But you know the gifts and the skills and talents that we have too. And you know our hearts. Father, I pray that you would give us all that boldness and that courage to step in the ring with you and wrestle with you, to be real with you, to be honest, to be raw and go to that place where the truth could hurt, where the truth could be messy, but to stand in that place and allow you to reveal how you see us, to allow you to love us. Father I thank you that you are bigger than all the problems in this world I just pray that we would keep trusting you in whatever life looks like for us right now Amen